Jonathan Sapsed from uh, University of Brighton. And this is Phil Jones from Wired Sussex, who are our industry partners on uh, what is now a set of uh, projects around creative digital fusion, um, looking at the creative digital economy, specifically in the Brighton and Hove area of, uh, of East Sussex. And um, I'm, we're aware that, I mean, a lot of you will have heard some of the, the key results, the highlight results that we, uh, we published in the report last year in October, and we did a launch event in London at that time. Um, so I don't propose to spend a lot of time going over that, but just to revise of some of the sort of key main findings out of that. But what we really wanted to do was to look a bit more at some of the challenges to institutions and to creative digital firms and intermediaries arising from the results and try and stimulate some discussion around those. And so we'll be presenting some, some fresh research today that we haven't uh, thus far. So um, what fusion means for the creative digital economy and what we should do about it. First of all, we should say that this project, of course, was um, involved a large team of, um, first of all, academics from uh, University of Brighton and Sussex, both in uh, the Faculty of Arts and, uh, and the Business School, Centrum, and SPRU at the University of Sussex. And we had this, uh, this fantastic advisory board steering group with, uh, with David Doherty and Anne Morrison from the BBC Academy. Some great advice there. Hassan Bakshi as well. And uh, of course our industry partners, Wired Sussex, who are an intermediary membership organisation based in the, in the cluster, who are totally integral to the design of the, the project and uh, helping us design questions and so forth and helping us to get access into, uh, into the cluster and into the businesses. So uh, we, had, uh, we had this message from the, the Minister Ed Vasey who, uh, of uh, Culture, Communications and Creative Industries who uh, sent us this welcoming message, which was nice of him, welcoming the report, but also pointing out that, um, you know, that we're living in an increasingly convergent world where arts and digital technologies and the boundaries between them are, are blurring. And this is the basis for the fusion that we're, we're really interested in here. And uh, it really came out of uh, a report called The Fuse some two, three years ago by the Council for Industry and Higher Education um, which is now National Council for Universities and Business, um, which really sort of set up the hypothesis that you know, it's from the combination of creative design and digital technology where the new growth will come from in the new economy. And uh, at that stage, it really was some anecdotal evidence, but also uh, proposing uh, that hypothesis. And so we were left with the task to try and operationalize this and uh, to try and uh, test it as a hypothesis. And um, we went through quite a systematic um, method of, uh, uh, first of all, a quantitative survey where we ended up with a, um, a response rate of 32% of 1,500 companies that we found in Brighton and Hove. Um, so that's 500 responses from firms, which is a fantastic uh, response that you don't often find in surveys of this type. And, we haven't seen a, a study of a cluster that was so detailed and has produced so much data as this. Um, we also did uh, some 77 qualitative interviews and uh, an observation, trying to get some context on the quantitative results we were getting through the survey um, in this Brighton Fuse project. So as for this presentation, so I, want, I just want to like briefly go over the, the, the headline results from the project um, and then talk a bit more about the barriers to fusion and growth and from my point of view particularly from the universities and what do the universities um, do about the challenges that are um, presented and suggested by the, the results that we found and, uh, and Phil will come in and, and look at it really from a, a business perspective and from an intermediary type of system uh, perspective and then we'll conclude and open up to your comments and questions. So, and you know, we've, we've, we've had some references this morning in various speeches, including the minister pointing out the, uh, the importance of uh, arts and humanities as part of that fusion mix in growth. And this is one of the, the key results. And there were several results that pointed to that. And one of the most interesting 
was uh, the, uh, the discipline of the entrepreneurs within the cluster, the population. So we found some 48% of entrepreneurs had, uh, had degrees in arts and humanities and design, so nearly half. And uh, we found that quite surprising. And uh, it, uh, as you can see, it compares well with, uh, with STEM here at 22.9%, and that's management and business at 11.1%. So arts and humanities are absolutely integral to uh, the formation of new businesses in the cluster. And they're businesses which are performing well. We found on average the growth rates um, across the whole sector were 14%, which is a conservative estimate. Um, but also this whole point about fusion, which is uh, the idea that you're combining ideas and technologies from creative design with the digital realm. And uh, so we had this key result which separated out the cohort, the th essentially three cohorts um, across the sample. And there's the, the unfused firms, which are essentially the, the more specialized ones. And then we have the fused companies who are somewhat dependent on combining artistic labor with, uh, with uh, technical labor, people programming and coding and so forth. And then you have the superfused category, who are very much dependent on the intersection of digital and the arts and business in order to achieve higher growth. Uh, and uh, so this was, the, uh, this was the sort of big result, really, that you find that the superfused firms are the ones have, they, they, grow, they have grown um, three times more than the unfused. So fusion is good for growth, it's good for business. And this was a, a key result for us, really, in, uh, in improving that case that it is the combination of arts with technology that produces good business performance in these uh, high-tech, high-growth, innovative sectors. We also found high levels of innovation, unusually high levels of innovation within the cluster. One of the interesting effects was the, uh, the fact that although you've got at the firm level and within projects, and also within coordinated events like festivals, which are outside the firm, that you have uh, you know, this strong effect of fusion. But outside of that, actually, fusion is quite weak. At the community level, people tend to retreat back into either the programming communities or the artists' meetups. Um, people generally go back to their tribes when they are not coordinated and managed in this way. And so this effect seems to need some sort of coordination and management, which I think is a, a, a key result as well. So, so those barriers, um, yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm based in a, a business school, although I work on creative industries. And so we tend to approach every problem by thinking of it as a management problem. What can management do about this? And a lot of these barriers, there's not much that management can do about. So the current economic climate, I mean, this is going back um, a year or two now. So it's, uh, you know, in the depths of the recession, um, too much competition, these kinds of things. Um, competition in you know, new growth sectors like the App Store, for example, are proving to be uh, 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 very hard competition for small firms that are, are getting into these, uh, these new markets. Um, so difficulties around there. Um, but something that's much more interesting, perhaps, is the, 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 the actual skills barriers that were reported, particularly by the superfused firms and the fused firms. Right? So the mastery column here, mastery is uh, where firms have difficulty in um, managing and organizing, coordinating business and have difficulty in finding people with the right skills in order to, to deliver the kinds of services and products um, that they're trying to, to achieve. So here we can see the Fuse and the Superfuse firms you know, have difficulties with, um, they report difficulties with skills barriers. Um, and we find the same effect with those firms that are most innovative. Um, in all these different categories of innovation, we can see that the, uh, the firms that are doing well and innovating to a high degree are the ones that are having difficulty in finding the right sort of talent and, and developing the kind of talent that they already have. So then the question is, you know, what role do the universities play? Um, there ought to be a role for universities in the, in the provision of skills and talents and so forth. And uh, all, the, all the studies of university industry links 
um, have tended to stress the role of development of talent in terms of the graduate pipeline. And uh, this too in the study we found, funnily enough, it's the, the, the educated entrepreneurs that are performing very well. We find that it's, if, you're, if you have an undergraduate degree, you tend to do better in terms of growth rates than, uh, than no degree. There's kind of a blip with the, the master's level for some reason. But uh, you go up to MBA, again, it's better to have an MBA than a first degree, and it's better to have a PhD than an MBA. Um, which is, you know, to, to a lot of people, that would be quite surprising evidence. You know, you wouldn't find Alan Sugar predicting that result, would you? And a lot of uh, people from industry. So, um, so there, do, there does seem to be some kind of role that, you know, in the universities we are producing some talent which is finding its way into industry and, and, uh, and performing well. And also we, we, we found that uh, a large number, an unusually high, large number compared to... Uh, to, um, to other studies of the firms are engaging with the universities. Right? We found 56% of the sample are engaging with the universities. But this kind of engagement, and here it's a very similar result to what was found by the Cambridge group who did the AHRC funded Hidden Connections report. That it's not, it's not the sort of the linear model of producing intellectual property from the universities and then applying that in the commercial world. It's not about academic spin-off businesses, but it is about informal networking. It's about placements. It's about use of facilities and co-organizing events, doing joint research, as we're, we're talking about now. So, I mean, these are the sort of the channels that we found that are most popularly used by the companies in, uh, in the cluster. Some differences across sectors. So we find that content firms are, are are giving lectures um, and selling services to the universities, web design, that kind of thing. And uh, there's, a, there's a very strong digital marketing um, sector in Brighton, which is offering placements to, um, to business students, um, as are the arts organizations. So um, that's the kind of uh, um, types of engagement that we find. In terms of the, the factors that affect this engagement with the universities, so, I mean, the most important one is, is size. It tends to be the larger firms that engage both more broadly and more deeply with the universities. Um, and the problem, of course, with the creative digital economy is that most firms are very small. So they don't have the time, they don't have the resources to explore and to find out what everybody's doing in the universities and explore opportunities for, uh, for doing co-development and so on. Um, we also found that um, the younger firms, the ones that were established in the 2000s, are engaging less than the ones that were established in the 1990s. So there again, you can imagine that um, perhaps after a period of time when firms are more established, then they start to turn their attention to what the universities can do and how they can engage with them. Uh, so interestingly, fusion itself is not really a factor in terms of this, uh, the barriers to engagement, and uh, except for this one result, which is that there are lower levels of fused firms using university training services, and uh, so this is kind of a puzzling result in a way, because you know we find that you know it's the fused, superfused firms that are reporting the skills gaps that we talked about before, and so the question there is, you know, is this non-usage? Is that because there isn't suitable training? facilities available for the fused firms, or is it because of something else? Is it because of attitudinal barriers or something else? And you may have your own views on, uh, on why this is. Um, so in terms of barriers to engagement, we, we found that two thirds of the firms are reporting barriers to engagement. But what we find is that the ones that actually are doing more engagement are reporting less, that this is less of a problem, right? So you know, this raises the question, is this really are these barriers real, or are they something which is you know, partly imagined? Um, so the kinds of things which come up as being important factors are things like lack of information about what the universities can offer is the most important barrier. Um, lack of time to explore, which you would expect with small firms. Not knowing who to, who to talk to. We all know if you're a firm facing the university, it's not clear where the entry point is uh, in terms of uh, of faculties and uh, 
the fact that we have these very siloed uh, uh, disciplines, um, which is not very fused. Um, we did find lack of relevance, you know, is not really a problem. They, they don't perceive the universities as, as irrelevant and uh, certainly not interested, which uh, is good to hear. Um, and we find that, um, you know, somewhat surprisingly, the fused firms are less likely to consider university services as irrelevant. Right? So again, this is a sort of puzzling result in, in terms of what we found that they are using university training services um, less. So, implications, you know, as a contract researcher, I'm bound to say more research is needed, that we, uh, we still don't fully understand uh, this problem of, uh, of, uh, of training and what kind of training is, is required by uh, the fused and superfused firms. And I think we, you know, we all know that there are these kinds of so-called innovators' dilemmas, that if you're trying to do something experimental with an uncertain market, you do come up against difficulties with course development in terms of scale of student numbers and getting through the validation process and so forth. And, and uh, we do have these kinds of difficulties in the uh, higher education sector. Um, we also find, you know, and this was kind of a surprise to me, but with, with formal degrees, you find that academics are actually saying that, you know, actually students may be one of the, the biggest barriers and their parents, because actually many times they, they prefer to do a specialized degree. And if you've signed up for a post-production degree, you don't want to spend half your time doing life drawing and management training, right? So, um, so there's, there's issues there as well. So, um, in the, I mean, the University of Brighton at the moment, we're, we're considering options for and discussing, setting up a, a kind of a new interdisciplinary hub where we can draw people from the different faculties to research the fused uh, curriculum and see what, what new offerings we can develop across faculties and uh, look at that. And we're talking to creative skill set and to, to what Phil is doing in the fuse box as well, which, um, which uh, he's about to talk to you about. I mean, in terms of conclusions, recommendations, so, I mean, I think, you know, the, the overwhelming message from the, the, the first fuse report is that arts and humanities is, you know, is key to this interdisciplinary interaction, um, which has the effects of economic growth and innovation. And, uh, and so there you have a clear economic rationale for why it should continue to be supported alongside STEM. So it's not arts and humanities versus STEM in any way, but it is the combination, the fusion of them, which produces these effects. And we observe that the higher education system is very much set against this interdisciplinary approach, not only in terms of, of uh, you know, the way that our courses and, and on the educational side are organized, but also in terms of the REF, you know, interdisciplinary research, our, our colleagues in SPRU have shown in science policy that um, where you have uh, research which bridges disciplines, this tends to get punished in terms of the, uh, the evaluation of research within our, our very disciplinary structured research evaluation framework. So, uh, some issues there. I'll pass on to Phil now, who uh, will give us the other view. <laughs> I haven't got a PowerPoint. Um, the, the, the second part of the title of this was, uh, uh, and what are we going to do about it? Um, I'm not quite sure who the we is, to be honest. Um, so can I just get a sense? Uh, how many people here are from universities? Oh, that's the we, isn't it? How many people are from policy backgrounds? Okay. And how many people are from business? Okay. Okay, so I think... Um, uh, as Jonathan touched on there, uh, if, 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 the, if the we is, is around policy, there's one clear, uh, unambiguous, from my point of view, finding around uh, the FUSE research, and that is that historically the arts have been seen as something you engage in after you've made your money. So the arts are something you do when you've made some money elsewhere, you're a philanthropist or you invest it in the arts or something like that. Really this research turns that on its head and says that the arts are core and fundamental to the way that these businesses in this cluster are actually generating value. They're not something you do afterwards, they're part of that process. So if you're interested in policy, that's something that you have to take to heart. In fact, whether they thought about it in these terms or not, and probably not, people like the Arts Council, when they were investing 
in the arts in Brighton were actually investing in the economy in Brighton in ways they probably didn't imagine. So I think that's really key. Um, in terms of universities, look, um, uh, Jonathan often has a go at me for having a go at universities, so I'll try not to today. And I've never worked in a university in my life. And, and um, I think it's, it's incredibly challenging for universities uh, to think about ways that they might take this idea of fused skill sets on board. Um, universities, I don't know, they have very particular kind of uh, cultural, organisational and commercial models which often mitigate against bringing departments or skill sets together. You know, content is produced in silos, uh, not across silos. There is some ad hoc work that's taking place to try and address that and, 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 and you know, uh, Jonathan and others at the University of Brighton are trying to do that. But it's very, very difficult to do um, I've worked for big companies in the past and I know how difficult it is for big companies to move and often they don't have the social imperatives that universities have. So I can see how difficult it is for universities. But there are some opportunities out there. And one of the findings and one of the interesting things from my point of view around the uh, Brighton Fuse research was the stuff that's taking place at the business level, at the firm level, at the level of an individual business. And it was at that level, actually, that we saw the most interesting dynamics around the concept of fusion. Even more so, I suggest, than, than some of the um, uh, interventions, to some of the activities which were specifically designed to address fusion, like festivals and things like that. Actually, businesses um, at a very grassroots level were doing more. They weren't just doing it in terms of creating fused products or fused services, but through the processes that they had to go through uh, in order to create a workforce that could work across these silos. And there's a whole range of different things that they've tried to do. Um, they're not systematic, and there's not one model that seems to stand out over others. But certainly there's a lot of stuff around culture of organisations and how you can create the culture of a, a fused organisation, a superfused organisation, that can blur those boundaries or bring people at least with different skill sets together. There's a lot of emphasis on play within those organisations. So a number of organisations have got things like 3D printers that you can muck around with or, or different, you know, the, 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 the stereotype, I guess, is the, is the table football in the corner, isn't it, as a way of, you know, that's what defines a digital marketing agency. But things have come a long way since then and there's a variety of different ways that organisations try and encourage uh, their workforce to play to bound together. But there's also more formalised things as well. One company, and it wasn't a big company, it had about 25 staff, had regular daily reading groups. So every day they put an hour aside for the team to come together and one person would talk about something that they'd read in that day. And that could be something from the arts, to humanities, design, technology or anything like that. So the, what was really interesting from my point of view is the way that businesses were often not at a conscious level but trying to cope with this idea of fusing those things together. Um, I think the final thing I just want to touch on is, is the fuse box. So the fuse box is really, I suppose, wired Sussex's response to uh, the fused research. And it's a, it's a space in a building in Brighton and we define it as... Um, an art school for technologists. So what we're trying to do is help entrepreneurs and help startups think about the ways that they can use not just the skill sets that they uh, feel naturally that they need to have in order to build a technology business, but also skills from the arts, processes from the arts, ways of thinking from the arts as well, to help them uh, conceptualise how they might create and grow their business. Um, when we were um, uh, thinking about uh, how to create that space, and that's a space that's kind of uh, privately run because we're a, a limited company, Wired Sussex, 
when we're thinking about that space, we talked to a number of other institutions uh, that we admired that were doing kind of similar things. So we talked to a whole range, but, and there's some stuff about it actually in, in, as, a, as an addendum to the FUSE report, but we talked to a D School, which is uh, based at Stanford University, you may have heard of. We talked to the Brighton Institute of Modern Music, who we admired because of the way that they tried to bring technology and creativity together in a collaborative way. And we talked to the School of uh, Communication Arts uh, based in Brixton that some of you might know. And they all said the same thing. They all said, don't do it with a university. Don't try and create this with a university because if you do that, you won't have, you won't be able to be as agile and responsive um, as you need to be in order to create something like this. And that was interesting because obviously D School is part of Stanford University. And when we talked to them, they said, yeah, we created D School, which is now, you know, world renowned, I'd suggest, you know, as being a conduit into Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, it's got this fantastic uh, workspace right in the middle of the campus. They said, we started off in a, a caravan, or, or, or as they called it, a trailer, right on the edge of campus, right on the edge of campus. And if we hadn't have started like that in a way that the, you know, nobody could see what we were doing, we wouldn't have been, had the freedom to, to fail and the freedom to develop the model that eventually became D School. So even an organisation that's part of a university said, don't do it with the university. And I think the opportunity for universities isn't to say to people like the fuse box, oh, you're doing it without us, we'll just ignore you. The opportunity is to see us as your outliers, as the people who, who have the freedom, the opportunity to actually um, try and innovate around this challenge and learn lessons which you may be able to learn from us and which you may not have because of your institutions, the freedom to do on your own. So that's my recommendation in terms of what, it, what are we going to do about it in terms of policy, universities and business. Cheers. Can we take questions now? I think we can take <laughs> questions, yes. Questions, comments, please. Yes. So yeah, John Baird, so I'm the lead for the digital economy theme in EPSRC, working closely with AHRC and the ASRC. Fantastic stories you've got there. And uh, I always use the analogy when I'm giving talks that the whole interdisciplinary approach is so important. And Steve Jobs, when he was launching iPad 2 uh, a few years ago, made this really good quote. And he said, technology alone is not enough. And this is the guy who headed it, or one mm. of the leading technology companies in the world. And what he went on to say was it's the fusion, the marriage of arts and creativity uh, that yields results that make our hearts sing. So fantastic quote. Anyway, that wasn't yeah. what I wanted to say particularly. But, and, uh, and LSD, I think, was uh, the other component. Well, yeah, he, didn't, he didn't say that at the time. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, you're probably right. But anyway, the point is really, so this Fuse, Fuse project, really, really interesting and the creative industries down in Brighton. But there's whole other clusters of sort of industries. I mean, not far from here in Shoreditch, there's all this sort of high-tech hub Silicon Roundabout and people keep hyping it up. But I think the, the problem we've got, and it's something I keep uh, thinking about, how, how is it that when we're funding things in research and lots of projects and studentships, and all these companies say the same thing, yeah, we want skilled people, uh, we want to make better links with people, we want to have secondments, and all the stuff you've talked about. But the government are obsessed with growth, and the impact story's been going for many years. I think the vision is how can you take all the examples of things we've learned and actually say, right, these are the seeds we've sown, we've, we might have spin out companies or whatever it is, or we've got these fused type things. How do you then get bigger companies to grow? You know, how do we create the apples and the Googles in the UK from mm. this stuff, uh, instead of just lots of little companies that then get bought up by the apples and Googles and stuff like that? There's a sort of dilemma yeah. between the sort of mm, yeah. nurturing lots of little seedlings that never seem to get very high, but how do we create the giant sunflowers and, and, and things of the forest of the future? Mm. There's a guy behind. I don't know if we should. Yeah. He, sounds, he looks like he wants to answer that question. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're spot on. Um, <laughs> so I'm Dick Penny from Watershed in Bristol. And I'm afraid I get really cross 
when I hear that really old-fashioned thinking, all the research in the Western world is that big corporates shed jobs. They drive efficiency. All the growth is coming from SMEs. Growth can be more SMEs, not just an SME that becomes huge. And we need to look at both. You know, we need to stop chasing the one big bet. And we need to see a lot of very, very different flowers grow. Okay. Mm. Uh, so, so I'd, I'd, I'd just like to pick, on, um, just pick up on the bit about um, ambition, actually. Because that came up, um, uh, and it talks to your thing about creating the Googles of this world. Because that was one of the issues that came up when we were doing um, the research. Are companies in Brighton ambitious enough? Um, and I think there's, there's, there's three answers to that. One is that um, ambition is a socially defined term. And the government likes to define ambition as creating something which has got value to UK KPLC. Individuals who are creating companies may define ambition as something which means I make enough to live on, but I also give something back to the community. And I also um, have time with my family. And that's as, that's as legitimate, I think, an ambition as creating uh, wealth for, for the UK. I think the second thing to say is, even in, you know, even in places like Brighton, as the sector begins to mature, we see um, some big companies beginning to grow. We, we see three or four Epic, you know, who um, have got offices you know, in Brazil, you know, and doing most of the um, e-learning for the Olympic Games. Uh, Brazilians are working on the Olympic Games. We've got Brandwatch, it's got you know, social media companies, got offices in Austin, New York, San Francisco, and things like that. So we begin to see that. But the third thing, I think, is that actually not only is a definition of ambition socially conditioned, but, but the, the, the context is also socially conditioned. So my background is the independent TV production sector. And I remember um, in, uh, when I worked in that sector that everybody said, it's just a lifestyle industry. It's just a bunch of people who make, like, like to make nice little programs um, and are not really ambitious about their companies. Then we got, we got the Communications Act Within that, there was the terms of trade, which said to broadcasters, you have to ensure that independent producers get some IP out of what they produce. You can't just take it all off them. And suddenly, you know, all those people who are just running lifestyle businesses suddenly became world beaters, and they are creating the content that makes the UK one of the most significant TV players in the world. So we haven't got that actually in the superfused economy at the moment. We haven't got that opportunity for people to kind of realise their ambition. So just to give you one example before I finish, there's a company in Brighton who produced this app. And in the first three months that it was uh, live, it was the most successful app in terms of generating revenue ever up to that point. So in three months, it generated £80 million worth of revenue. Um, I, mean, I don't know if anyone knows what the app is. I'll tell you, it's the app so you can buy stuff from Tesco's on your mobile phone. And that's how it generated money. That company got £80,000 for that. You know, if that's the disparity, then you know, it's no wonder that people aren't ambitious. Hmm. I'll just add to that. I mean, because I think this <laughs> That's is my uh, opinion. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah. I mean, this this point about the you know, the lifestyle business, which is this disparaging term that you often hear. Well, the UK companies uh, interested in growing enough, and it seems to be applied quite a lot to Brighton, and that seems to be part of the Brighton effect, is that people generally are attracted to Brighton for the quality of life, and we found that you know, over ninety percent of the entrepreneurs that have set up businesses. You know, have come from other places. And it's very much consistent with what Richard Florida talks about in that you have creative cities with amenities and culture, biggest arts festival in England, the beach and so forth, so that attracts people for the quality of life. And you know, you do hear that anecdotally that people move away from places like Shoreditch to have a better quality of life. They don't want to spend a weekend working 
They don't want to you know, order, be ordering pizza at the desk at 11 o'clock every night in the studio, right? So, um, so that has been an important part of it and something that we've had to think through in terms of, uh, you know, is this necessarily such a bad thing in terms of motivation? Um, but I think, I mean, in terms of growth, I mean, the way that we measured growth in this is firstly in revenues and secondly in, in jobs, right? So, yeah, I think we'd all agree that certainly it's better to be employing 25 people than, than 10 probably. And, uh, but what we, what we don't have for the final results was, uh, was profits actually. So um, we're hoping to, to do a second a panel survey, a follow-up, which will be looking more at not only the sort of the turnover and revenues, but also how much are our entrepreneurs able to retain in terms of profits. So just on that. And also, like, as you say, John, there are other clusters around the UK um, that you know, we're thinking about you know, what would be the best strategy for doing some kind of comparison. And of course, Shoreditch is the one that always comes up, but it's difficult to think about the boundaries of Shoreditch and what do you include, what do you not include? Does it creep into Dalston and Tottenham and so forth? But uh, yeah. The young gentleman over there. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name's Graham Hitchin. Um, it's just an observation, really. I, th I find it interesting that people talk about clusters. Shoreditch is a cluster, Brighton is a cluster, Bristol is a, is a cluster. If you're sitting in Beijing, the cluster is actually Western Europe, um, or, or at the very least, a sort of agglomeration of um, cities and uh, sets of creative and technology communi communities which are interdependent. Because it's certainly the case, and I mean, you know, there are various people, probably some of them in the room, that when the concept tech city was invented, that apart from the fact that it was very London-centric, I didn't mind that as somebody who came from London. What I did mind hugely as somebody who's worked for a long time in the creative and digital economy was that it was incredibly parochial. This notion that somehow London survives without any relationship whatsoever with Bristol, Brighton, Manchester, Glasgow, and other clusters around the UK. I mean, it's just a nonsense. So I think that what we need, I mean, I think what's really interesting, and I, th I think the fuse, the whole concept of fuse has helped us understand is the interrelationship between creative and digital, which we need to understand more. And I think, I think we've got to stop talking about it from an arts and humanities point of view. I think we've got to, I think what would be really interesting would be to go, go to some clusters that actually are historically very tech-based, so to Cambridge, to take one example, and there will be others, and actually try and understand the concept of fuse from within, from within a tech concept rather than within a, a creative concept. And that second, that we, try, we, we stop, you know, we understand the interdependence of the different clusters and the different sets of businesses. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. It, it, um, yesterday, um, uh, it was uh, the, the Minister for Cities, uh, Greg Clark, signed a city deal for Brighton, and this is sort of some kind of arrangement with the um, with the government about uh, the economic strategy for the for the Brighton region. And I was part of the pitch team to ministers about that, and part of our pitch was built on the Brighton fuse. So we talked about superfused companies, and completely. There was no sense of understanding. I won't tell you which ministers were in the room. It wasn't David Willits, but there was no sense of understanding about what a superfused company meant in that context. And what they said to us was, "Just call it Tech City South. Then we'll kind of get it." You know. Um, so we do have kind of challenges at that level, and there, there is a feeling that we've got this model which is Tech City, and all we need to do is kind of roll it out. And part of what we're saying is, no these things need to be bottom up and, and, and you know in different places these will take different forms because they're growing in different soils now there may be lessons that you can learn from the Brighton fuse but you can't just take the Brighton model and place it somewhere else like Cambridge or, th or something like that and also whilst you're right that you know you can be very parochial about the city which delivers, what, 22% of the UK's GDP? So, you know, whilst you can be parochial about that, you also have to sort of understand the relationship um, between these cities and, and um, 
uh, London. And um, we, we held a series of events with businesses and others as part of this kind of process. And um, someone from one of the businesses said, well, you, you know, actually economic theory isn't the best way to understand that. Freudian analysis is the best way to understand that. And I think to some extent she might actually be right. Mm. I mean, this is in relation to one of the findings we found is that uh, the Brighton cluster is very dependent on London for business. So I mean, 30 or 40% of clients are, are based in London. And people talk about the train as the money train from Brighton into Victoria, because you get on the train at the end of it, there's money, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, so this interdependence, you know, although the work may be done locally and there may be collaboration and outsourcing done locally that a lot of the business is elsewhere. And, and you know, you see this um, cropping up a lot in the policy debate. Ed Vasey talks a lot about, we've got to join up the clusters, and, um, which uh, is something that Phil's working on with Manchester and Bristol as well. And days like this help in, in terms of the hubs, of course. Um, but you also see, I mean, uh, there's a sense, there is a kind of anti-cluster sentiment that you sometimes hear in political circles, I think, that, you know, are they in such a, a good idea? Maybe it would be better if they were squashed down and it was all a bit more equal, and particularly with the ultra-fast broadband uh, initiative. And it was suggested that a lot of that ought to be diverted to places like New Haven and away from Brighton and out to Hastings, where the, the broadband really isn't very good at all. So I think we're probably saying that we think that's, that wouldn't be a helpful deviation of resources. That you do have these sort of natural organic clusters that do grow up and uh, to try and replicate them in other places is, uh, is, 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 uh, is difficult to say the least. Yes, there's someone at the back. And someone at the front, so the Thanks. guy with the um, microphone is oh, yeah, yeah. running. John Newbegin from Creative England. It seems to me one of the things that gets left out of the equation quite often is that clusters are about people as well as businesses. And uh, um, at Abate uh, in Dundee, when Real Time Worlds employing 150 people, uh, no, 300 people I think it was employing, kind of blew up, uh, having overstretched themselves and talking to a couple of people at Abate to say this must be a catastrophe for the local economy and the answer was not at all because those people aren't going anywhere. In fact what's happened is there's 20 or 30 new startups beginning that are regenerating what's going on in the area and, uh, and that is certainly true of Brighton where it's the people that are in Brighton rather than the business formations which constantly change and the relationship of the university to those individuals, both University of Brighton and University of Sussex seems quite important and Dick Penny was talking a moment ago, I remember in, uh, having a conversation or overhearing a conversation in Bristol about why, why is Bristol successful? And Dick's answer was because people come here and stay because they like it. Mm. I think that, that dimension and the role of universities in creating <laughs> clusters that are about people and have a social dimension as well as a company formation dimension is something that we leave out of the equation all too easily. And, and one other point, picking up on what you were saying about being an independent television producer, it does seem to me that the the single most effective uh, policy for developing creative industries in this country ever was the invention of Channel 4, which started on the premise not of let's build super gigantic companies, but let's provide a platform for small independents to go on being small independents. And in time, they did grow and did become very successful. And then, as you pointed out, when the terms of trade were tweaked in the Communications Act, it created a different kind of climate in which it was possible for some of those businesses to grow and become very large businesses indeed. But actually, on the whole, they have replicated the Channel 4 model of acquisitions, buying up little companies, but letting them go on being little companies within a bigger group. And I think, you know, you say the, the kind of, it is not part of the UK business culture to, um, to build Google's, Apple's, um, uh, Microsoft's or whatever, it does seem to be that people do like to keep businesses small. That's the way the business culture works. Rather than, than dreaming on about, hey, let's build another Google, it seems to me you work with the dynamics that exist in this country very successfully and work at how little guys and big guys work together and support each other. And in that context, again, the role of the university as one of the, one of the kind of agents of glue that help little to punch above their weight is rather important. And it seems to me we often leave those things out of the equation. Do you want to say something about the black purpose? Yeah. Um, I mean, the real-time real world case is, uh, is very similar to a case in Brighton as well, where there was a big studio called Black Rock, which was acquired by Disney, and Disney ended up divesting it. And again, it was 170 people were made redundant overnight. And since then, we've had the last count, 
16 spin-off companies, mostly doing apps. Um, but again, it's, I mean, it shows it's that kind of resilience that you find in a cluster, and very much about the people, as you say, the interactions that people have. They set up Facebook groups, they set up um, uh, all kinds of virtual networks to help people out with uh, business opportunities. They had a meetup in a pub every two weeks where they would invite business lawyers to come and advise them on how to set up a new company. IP lawyers, accountants, and so forth, sharing resources in this way. And very much in a face-to-face -face way, as well as uh, in the virtual space. So I'm, uh, I'm actually very keen to come up to Abate and, uh, and uh, do a comparison, actually, with the real-time world case, because I know it, there's a lot of similarities and some interesting differences as well. Yes, please. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. Uh, Jonathan, I was uh, struck by two things you said. The first was something you said just now when you talk about a money train. So I've come all the way from sunny Nottingham to get here in the peak time, and you talk about money trains that cost £166 to get to this city from Nottingham in the peak time. That's bollocks. <laughs> uh, but my second thing was the thing that you said about uh, tribes and you said something about people do something and then they go back to their tribes. Yeah. And I've, that really struck a chord with me because I wonder in this wonderful networked world in which we're living, the thing that strikes me is we seem to be getting more and more tribal rather than less and it seems to infect. I work at a university and it's just all these invisible tribes in a glass palace where I work and teach with glass walls were all divided up amongst the management and the academics, and then there's all different subdivisions among the academics and the security. It's amazing within that organization. Mm -hmm. And that is just magnified outside. So the idea of fusion is quite curious, because do people come and fuse, and then they just go off and back to their tribes again? Yeah. My ticket costs 48 pounds in Brighton. Mine costs 16 quid from Brian. Well, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Came later in the day. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, absolutely. I mean, the, I think this, what this shows is that, you know, fusion doesn't happen on its own. And I think it does relate to the whole disciplinary silo tradition of the way people are educated, you know. That is this, you know, the, the social psychologists will say that, you know, we are attracted to people who are similar and we tend to coalesce in similar homogenous communities. Um, but it's also kind of learned behaviour, right, in the way that we're trained, and the way we're educated. Um, so we're either, you know, programmers or we're artists and, and designers and so forth. And I mean, that is what we've tended to find in terms of the way people socialise. And the, but that's also your community of practice, right? So that you have something to bring to the fusion. So yeah. it's a, it's a question for universities as well, is that because you know, there's always the Ian Livingston and in, uh, in the uh, the skills debate in the games industry will always say that you know, the, they always like to hire the, the physicists and uh, the mathematicians and not the people doing game design um, um, from universities because they want that sort of disciplinary focus, that sort of that rigorous training that you get in a discipline. So, you know, I mean, I think that it does, it raises questions about, you know, to what extent do we want to be offering highly fused courses, or do we want to you know, offer people you know, the opportunity to have a place in the tribe? You know, to what extent getting that balance right is not yeah. that, that I simple. Mean, the, 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 one of the findings, in terms of the way that people in the cluster, particularly superfused companies, developed skills was, was actually the opposite of what we expected. So what we expected was that they get specific skills about their specific skill set through work and through learning at work, and outside, they'd mix across the tribes. In fact, it worked the opposite way around. So it's the, it, it, at the firm level, they were fusing together and mixing. And once outside that, they'd upskill by going along to community groups or meetups, which were Drupal meetups or, or, or particular subject areas. So it kind of, as Jonathan said, it worked the opposite to the way that we expected it to work. And, and, and I guess, you know, often these things are put in terms of the T-shaped person, aren't they? So that, you know, you have a depth of skills, but you yeah. can also bridge and understand across a variety of different skill sets. Yeah. But also, I think your role in things like Digital Festival, 
has been important because you know this is the role of intermediaries to bring people together in these sort of coordinated events, and that's that's been a great example of uh, you know, kind of a, a, a conscious attempt to bring together artists with digital practitioners. Hello there, Catherine Harper, University of Portsmouth. Um, I'm interested in just what's just been said, and then I want to just say something about a little earlier. Uh, the notion of the, the fused curriculum seems to have come up now in the in the recent conversation, and I wondered whether, in a sense, uh, the question between disciplinary practice and interdisciplinary practice comes up here, and really how we make sure that people have enough disciplinary and skills knowledge to fall back on, but at the same time have enough flexibility and nimbleness to be the kind of person who can duck and dive and be entrepreneurial in their creative career for the length of that creative career. And I just wondered if you had something to say to that. But before that, can I just say something, which was about the, the question at the very beginning that was posed to the, the audience and how interested I was that uh, many of us are from universities. When we were then asked who was from business, nobody from the universities put up our hands. And actually, <laughs> I think it might be worth us thinking about why. I was very tempted to and I didn't because I think actually we are businesses too and we operate the mixed economy that any business does, some of which doesn't connect with, bus with businesses we're talking about, some of which is about you know, teaching students and so on. But clearly, uh, second question would be, are universities getting better at linking with business, getting more nimble in our domains of contact and how we talk and express and connect and do business with businesses. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think you can, you, can, you know, we can overdo the argument that you know there aren't about the disciplinary silos, and of course there are great examples, and there are examples within the digital economy program of, uh, of great fusion. There are institutions that that do this very well. Bournemouth is a good example. A lot of the the other creative skill set accredited academies, um, Portsmouth as well, Solent and so forth. Um, so there are people that are on the ground doing that kind of work. But I think, I mean, part of that specific issue around, you know, kind of short courses, things that are very kind of short term need for the business, like we're not really set up to, to address those kinds of needs. That's the difficulty, I think. You know, we're much more in the in the realm of, of uh, one to two year courses. Although our Vice Chancellor said, actually, if you're with the removal of the cap of student numbers, that should open up a lot of possibilities, both in terms of you know, innovations, but also in terms of trying to cut down on the turf war, the territorialness about you know, protecting your student numbers and so forth. You know? So uh, I think you know, there are signs that, um, you know, we are businesses now, as you say, right? So it's. Uh, we, uh, we do need to find ways to kind of uh, meet the, uh, the market needs that, uh, that businesses are, are, um, are bringing to us. And, 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 um, and it's, uh, it's worth saying that it's very difficult, isn't it, um, for universities particularly to engage with smaller micro businesses. I mean, the, the NCUB talk about, you know, f from both ends of the spectrum, the transactional costs being too high for that to happen effectively. You know, it's much easier for the University of Sussex to engage with American Express, which has 6,000 people in Brighton and a big campus and things like that, than it is to engage with 20 or 30 um, small businesses. You know, they gain much more from it. And also, it's very difficult from the small businesses' point of view. You know, universities are the size of small towns. You know, you wouldn't stand in the middle of a small town and shout out, can someone help me please? You know, it's very, very challenging, I think. So sometimes I think it's surprising that it, it, it happens at all. And, and it's impressive that it happens at all. Where I think there are challenges is that, that particularly around research, often, you know, there's an obligation for universities to engage with business as part of getting the research grant. And often that is such an afterthought. So. Researchers say, I want to do this, this and this, or I wonder if there's a couple of usual suspects I can bang at the bottom and get a letter of support in order to get that research done. What was great about this bit of research is we were partners from the very beginning, so we developed and pitched you know, the research idea together. We weren't an afterthought as the business part of it. 
I think that's really important to say because clearly something continues to intrigue business in relation to universities and universities in relation to business. So clearly there's something there that isn't worth either partner walking away from. And I think you're talking about a model where it has worked and where both sectors, if you like, are learning from each other and we have to continue to do so. Uh, there's one, one at the back. Thank you. Uh, Michael Mara from Design in Action. Um, I thought your anecdote about the, the government minister in the um, kind of South uh, Tech City was, South, was, was yeah. an illustrative, actually, of maybe some of what the guys were saying about economic policy. And just as suppose the point is that um, the economic policy has a, a different purpose rather than just growth figures maybe across the piece. And maybe it speaks to some of the question about the replicability of the lessons um, and I suppose that the, my, my question in there is about whether um, what you've captured is a, a moment in time and space, a, a, a question of placemaking in terms of Brighton, um, and how much more the lessons can be altered, changed. And I think it's a fascinating piece of work, but I wonder how much more we can draw on the different characteristics and make something of it. Um, because the, my last part would be to say that um, you know, Alex Salmond, the First Minister of Scotland, was in London last week and gave this speech about the dark star of London sucking all this kind of uh, the um, wealth and uh, people and ingenuity out of the rest of the country and actually if an economic policy that doesn't counteract that has other consequences as we may well find out at the end of the year. Yeah. Perhaps this is an opportune time to talk about what we're doing now and next. Um, we have follow-on projects. So um, so we're planning to do the, the survey, the firm survey again, and to try and build a panel, to try and get some of those ideas of you know, what happens in the dynamics over time when businesses fall away and, and new ones come up, and trying to see what, what the causality might be. You know, it, does networking in, in one year help you with growth in the next year, for example, these kinds of questions. Um, and secondly, you know, one area that we haven't really done justice to in the first study was the, the whole freelancer sector. Because we did find that on average firms are using seven freelancers a year and they also employ seven people on average. So you can start to see there's, there's a lot of value being produced by temporarily contracted workers. And so we haven't really got their story and seeing uh, to what extent they are contributing to, the, to the, both the economic landscape but also in terms of uh, their conditions of work. Um, the way they skill themselves. I mean, one yeah. of the interesting things was we initially thought there were more companies in Brighton. Uh, you know, we ended up with uh, uh, 1,500, but we thought there was even more of than, than, than that. Um, but when we looked at these companies, we found out they were kind of one person. Uh, uh, we define them as freelancers with a brand because it may be someone who just does... Um, just does copywriting for a website, but they call themselves... Um, conscientious copywriting or something like that and so they create a brand around it and, and, and from the point of view of government stats they were just freelancers obviously from their own point of view they were trying to do something more there and something different they were trying to build a brand around themselves and possibly even try and build a company around around themselves and we felt that you know, we couldn't do justice to that that complexity in the original research and so we needed to focus particularly on freelancers and the role that they pay in sustaining the creative economy uh, and creative clusters more importantly much more and, 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 and you know there may be policy implications for that no one ever really thinks about how, how freelancers maintain those skills and, and, and stuff mm. like that and, and universities there's another challenge how do universities engage with freelancers so, yeah, we think that's a kind of a really interesting and important lacunae, really, in the, in, in the original project. Mm. Uh, I think we've come to the end of we've our come time. come to a, a natural close. <laughs> As our chair. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>